Hello, all astronomers. I'm going to make a video for each of the chapters, a little bit of a lecture so that you can go through and follow along some of the things in the course with me. Uh, these lectures will probably be anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes, but since they're recorded, you can come and go as you like and press pause and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but I will do my best to get them up in, a, in addition to the other material that you have as you're working through Mastering Astronomy. Now here's a caveat. When I went to the publisher's website, they did not have resources for me to download for edition nine. I don't know why, but it just said not available. So it's not available. So what I'm using is the PowerPoint displays that I got from a Canadian website of the uh, same publisher, Pearson, for the eighth edition. And I checked the table of contents. It's mostly the same, especially for our class. It's practically the same. And there may be some information here and there that's a little bit updated uh, in, in edition nine rather than from edition eight because astronomy does change. Uh, I will do my best to figure out whether or not what is happening on the lectures that I'm giving uh, has been updated in any way. And I invite you, if you see something in your text that's different from what I'm saying in the videos, uh, to let me know because that would be useful information. Uh, but anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to share, share the screen here. Uh, doesn't always work all that easily, but we will do our best. Uh, just as a, a, a little note, I noticed after I was reviewing some of the videos that the video I made for the syllabus seems to have had a problem. So I'm going to re-record that video after I do these lectures as well. For some reason, the syllabus disappeared on you. I could see it on my screen, but you couldn't see it on yours. Uh, so we'll see what we can do, make it a little bit better here. Uh, but let's see, I want uh, this PowerPoint to be on a slideshow and I want to start from the beginning here. So we are on the scale of the universe and these are our goals. There will be some things that I'm gonna just trust that you don't need me to tell you what's going on. So as we are looking at the universe, uh, we live on planet Earth, welcome home. That's my backdrop here. We are one of eight planets, sorry Pluto, uh, and, but we have dwarf planets and asteroids and meteors and, and comets and all sorts of other things in our solar system, which is centered around our sun. Our sun is one star in the Milky Way galaxy. Notice we're a spiral with a little bit of an elongation in the middle there. They're called a barred spiral galaxy. Then we are one galaxy among a couple of dozen galaxies in our local group. There are two main galaxies, two big galaxies. Uh, ours is one, the Andromeda galaxy is another. And then this group is part of a supercluster, which is a bunch of other groups grouped together with us. And that local supercluster is part of a network, which is almost like spider webby kinds of things, out throughout the rest of the universe. We have hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies that are out in the universe. So imagine how many planets there might be. But we're on planet Earth. We are going around our sun, which is a star. A star is a fusion reactor. It's a nuclear reactor. It's basically a nuclear power plant. And one of the things you can notice, we have these spots, these splotches here. Those are called sunspots. Those are darker areas, but they're still superheated. The only reason why they look dark is they're a little bit cooler than the rest. The rest of it's probably 5,800 to 68 uh, to 6,000 degrees. Uh, we're talking in the Celsius range here. When we look at these, they're about 1,000 degrees cooler, but that still means if I held one sunspot up in my hand, my hand would incinerate immediately and it would also be the brightest thing you've ever seen. Uh, we'll talk about the sun later in the semester. So everything I'm going through here now, I'm going through it somewhat close to light speed. We will develop more as we go through. One thing I want to highlight here, we can tell that the sun is three-dimensional. It's not flat. It's not Apollo's chariot wheel going through. In part, because we watch the sunspots go around, the sun does rotate, but we also have this darker area here. This is called limb darkening. 
Uh, limb darkening is uh, just like your limbs, your arms, and your legs. So if you think of it L-I-M-B, limb, it's sort of red stretching out. The, the light from the center here, say my face is the center of the sun, it's brightest, it's coming right at you. The light's coming right at you. Whereas the light on the sides is mostly going off to the sides. That's why it looks darker. But as the sun rotates around, we don't have a dark stripe that comes across. The limb remains darker. That helps us understand that the sun is in fact three-dimensional. Around the sun, and we only have one star in our central solar system here, we have planets. Now planets are moderately large objects. They have to be large enough to be spherical. They can't be wedge-shaped or potato-shaped or other things. And they have to be the only thing that gravitationally holds dominance in their orbit. That's confusing. We'll talk more about it later. Planets can be rocky, like Earth or Mars. Venus and Mercury round that out or they can be icy and gaseous. Uh, Uranus, not Uranus, that's it's something else. That's a joke on Bob and Tom show. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are often called ice giants because they are so far out and so frozen. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are the gas giants. Then around the planets, or even around a comet or an asteroid, not too many comets, but lots of asteroids, have moons. So we have moons around every planet, some dwarf planets like Pluto, Pluto has five moons. Uh, we don't have a moon around Mercury or Venus, but we have a moon or more around every other planet. Some moons like Ganymede here can be larger than planets. Then we have asteroids. Notice that it is small and rocky and odd shaped. Matilda here is, is a, a rocky kind of a thing. Some of them are frozen. Some of them are closer into the sun and are not quite so frozen. Uh, they're all very small. They're all much, much, much smaller than even Pluto is. They're smaller than states in the United States. In fact, some of them are as small as just Bloomington. So uh, they tend to be uh, dangerous if they hit us, but mostly they leave us alone. Comets are ice balls. When they come in close to the sun, they begin to melt. You can sort of see the melt sort of spewing off in different directions. That's what creates the tails off of the comets. There are two tails on comets. We'll talk more about that as well. But most of them live a frozen existence out beyond Uranus and Neptune and Pluto. Our whole system taken together is called the solar system. And sometimes you might see the sun referred to as Sol, S-O-L. And hence we have the solar system here, the solar system uh, that's there. So, so one of the things to keep in mind uh, as we are uh, looking at our solar system is that the sun actually has a name, Sol, better call Sol. Out beyond our solar system, we have a couple of different constructs that are worth noting. Uh, nebula, nebula is a Latin word meaning cloud. Uh, we have clouds of gas and dust that are out there. These are stellar nurseries. This is where stars and planets are formed in the first place. Some of them are bright, some of them are dark. Uh, if you take the 102 class, we explore these in a lot more detail. Taken all together, all of these planets and uh, stars and nebulae and other things form galaxies. This again is the great Andromeda galaxy, which is nearby to us. It's the other big galaxy in our local group. It's not the closest galaxy to us. It is the closest large spiral. Uh, so if there is a quiz question that says Andromeda is the closest galaxy, no, it's not the closest. It's the closest large spiral. Uh, so remember that along the way. But this is uh, hundreds of billions of stars. But it is so far away, it takes light over two million years to get from there to here. And because it's so far away, the light bleeds together. If we could see the whole thing in the night sky, it would be as large as 11 moons across. So it would be quite large. Uh, but we really only see with the naked eye this central bulge here because it's so compact. The universe is everything taken together. All the energy, all the matter, all the dark energy, all the dark matter. We'll talk about that more in 102 if you take that class. So you really should take that class sometime. Uh, but also the galaxies and planets and stars and moons and uh, comets and asteroids and green clovers and blue diamonds and all the other lucky charms. 
when we look out into space, as I was mentioning before, the Andromeda galaxy, it takes light a certain amount of time to get to us. It takes light 300,000, it travels at the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, or that translates into 186,000 miles per second. So to get from the Andromeda galaxy to us takes well over 2 million years. The sun is actually 93 million miles away. So you divide 93 million miles by 186,000 miles or 150,000 or 150 million kilometers, forgive me, for th uh, by 300,000 kilometers. And that means it takes eight minutes. The light that you're seeing from the sun left the sun's surface eight minutes ago. So if the sun blew up seven minutes ago, we wouldn't know for another minute. The brightest star in the nighttime sky is Sirius, the dog star, and the light that's there was just emitted about eight years ago. So the people on Sirius right now, if they're watching television broadcasts that are reaching them because it takes light from us eight years to get there, are just about to wonder if Barack Obama is going to get a second term. Uh, so, so yeah, when you're looking out into space, you're also looking back in time. The moon is only one second away, a little bit more than one second away. But if you listen to the moon landing when they, they had the, uh, the audio back and forth, you'll notice there's just a little bit of a gap between they speak, one Mississippi, then back to us, one Mississippi. There's a drag between those. By the time we look at Mars, if we ever land people on Mars, there will be several minutes of drag time in the conversation. When we're talking to probes that are out by Jupiter or out by uh, uh, past Pluto, where we have a couple of different probes that have gone out past Pluto, it can take a long, long time. It can take hours for a signal to get there and back to us. So if we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy now, when will we be able to see what it looks like right now? Uh, well, the answer is, of course, two and a half million years from now. So a light year which is sort of how far away this is. This is two and a half million light years away. That's not a time. Don't be dis uh, fooled by the word year here. This is a distance of how far light travels in one year. So the further out you're looking in space, the further back in time you're looking. Time and space are related to each other in that way. So keep that in mind. Why can't we see a galaxy that's 15 billion light years away? Well, we're going out beyond the distance that we can actually see because the, the universe isn't even 15 billion light years or isn't even 15 billion years old. So we don't have enough time for something that would be that far away to get to us along the way. So that would be looking at a time before the universe even existed. And that's rather difficult. Uh, so the universe is a big place. If we were to measure out the different things, if we were to say we take the sun and sort of crunch it down to the size of a grapefruit, how large do you think the Earth would be? Well, just a dot, just a pixel on the screen. Uh, so, so we are very, very small compared to the sun. All the planets are actually pretty small compared to that. And if we were to shrink the whole solar system down with the sun the size of a grapefruit, uh, the Earth would be 15 yards or 15 meters away. A meter is roughly a yard, so for purposes in our class, one of the things you may hear me say a lot is close is good in astronomy. A yard and a meter are close enough that we can say meters or yards. Uh, now, kilometers and miles are not close enough, but meters and yards are. Uh, so think 15 yards. Think in, on a football field, 15-yard uh, gain. That would be the difference between the sun and the earth. If the earth were a ballpoint pin pop, and the sun were a grapefruit. But as we get further and further and further out, we can see if we're going all the way out to Pluto, we're going to be answer D. It would take us, or no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is Alpha Centauri. Uh, it, it would, uh, uh, Alpha Centauri is our closest star. It would help if I read the actual thing, uh, the question that they're asking here. Uh, Alpha Centauri is four light years away, a little bit further away than that. Uh, so, so if we're talking about the nearest star to us, it would be on the other side of the country from Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of empty space out in space. Uh, when we're talking about how large 
the Milky Way galaxy is compared to that. Remember, we've got our sun grapefruit here in Washington, DC. We've got our Alpha Centauri, uh, other nearest star grapefruit over here in uh, San Francisco. So there's a lot of empty space there in terms of what would be out there. If we were to try to count all of the stars in our galaxy, it would take us a few thousand years at one per second. Uh, because think about it, there's 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 minutes in an hour. So 60 times 60, uh, we're talking about 3,600 there. There are 24 hours in a day. So when we're talking about 24 times 3,600, we're talking, I think it's, I think it's 84,600. Uh, but, but that's in just one day. We're not even up to anywhere close to 100 billion uh, with that. We're not even close to a million with that. It would take us a, more than a week to get to a million. And it would take us 52 weeks to get to 52 million if we were doing a million a week. And that we're, we're not even 10% of the way to 1 billion when we're doing that. So yeah, it's going to take us a very, 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 very long time to count everything along the way and to name everything. So if we think of the Milky Way is having even just 100 billion stars, and it probably has more. And there are 100 billion galaxies, perhaps more. What we do is we look at scientific notation. Notice these numbers here. 10 to the 11th means there are 11 zeros after that one. 10 to the 11th, there are 11 zeros after that one, which means we, when we multiply these two numbers together, 100 billion times 100 billion, we get, we can add these two numbers together. And we get a number that doesn't easily have a number. It, we're, 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 we're sort of getting off the charts there with what we commonly call numbers. I mean, we can go above billions into trillions and quadrillions and quintillions and so on, but typically we don't even use those words. We go to scientific notation as we're looking at things there. If we look at how large or how small the universe is, we can do what's called orders of magnitude, and that is going up or down by a scale of 10. So I'll let you do that in the exercises there. But you only have to sort of go up by a certain number, less than 30, before you get from us to the whole universe. And you only have to go backwards, down, smaller, 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 about 15 or 16 steps before that's it. It's too small. You can't go any further than that. So when we're looking at the universe as a whole, we have a history. The history began with the universe beginning. And just so you know, I am an ordained minister. I am Father Kurt. I am a chaplain at uh, uh, the local retirement home here called Beltrace. I'm happy to talk to you about Genesis. I'm happy to talk to you about religious ideas. But, but here's the thing. According to the way we operate in science and the way we talk about things in scientific terms, that's a different method than what one would use in, in a religious context. So I'm not challenging your religious views whatsoever. I'm telling you what science is presenting here. So if, if, if you don't want to believe this, believe me on this. These are the answers to your quizzes and these are the answers that will be held because this is a science course, not a religion course. I will be very happy off the clock of our class to talk to you about science and religion and all of those different kinds of things if that's something you truly want to do. Uh, so, so for purposes of our class, we will look at the way science operates, uh, which is as we look further back in time, we see different evidence pieces that tell us that the universe was more compact, that the universe began with a big bang. It's not an explosion as much as it's an expansion of things. Now, the question is, where did that come from? That's where we can get philosophical and theological, but the truth is, since we can't get too scientific with that right now. That's the kind of question that's not really helpful in a science context. That's one of the questions that we sort of leave to the side. Science does that a lot, actually, and sometimes comes back to them in a generation or two or three or other things, uh, in, in, depending upon how it is we're able to observe and understand things, which grows over time, just like our universe. So our universe expands. As it expands, things separate out, things cool off, things form. 
galaxies begin to form with the elements that were created. Most of the elements in here are hydrogen and helium, which were the original elements in the universe. Hydrogen combines in a fusion reaction to create heavier elements, helium being the next level up. So that's what's happening inside of our sun. That's what happens inside of most stars, uh, what we call main sequence stars. These are recycling plants. What's happening inside of the star, it is recharging uh, or charging uh, uh, up itself as it fuses hydrogen into helium. And if it's a larger star, it might make heavier and heavier elements, but eventually it'll run out of fuel and it will explode or expand out into a nebula and return its material back into the galaxy, which will then create new stars out of that material and the star will repeat the process. This is a recycling process. We are all part of the star stuff that's been recycled over time. Here on Earth, we are an assemblage of elements, uh, chemical elements that have come together under physics and biological processes to form an atmosphere, to form continents, to form water, to form a mantle and a crust and uh, a, a core, and all of the various other things that we have in our environment. Uh, we are still a lot of hydrogen, a lot of helium, but we have some heavier elements as well. There's a lot of oxygen in our planet, for example, not just in the air. There's a lot of oxygen locked into the, the solid stuff that makes up our planet as well. But all of this stuff comes from having been generated inside of stars. If we were to look at the universe as a calendar, and I'm going to post up a link to another uh, explanation of the cosmic calendar that Carl Sagan did in his series Cosmos. If we were to think about our history of the universe as a calendar year with the Big Bang starting when the ball drops on New Year's and we are here at the end of the year, uh, December 31st, waiting for the next one, all of human history happened within the last 30 seconds. Even the dinosaurs didn't show up until about Christmas Day, and they disappeared uh, by the time we get to the day before New Year's Eve. Uh, so, so they didn't last long either. The Earth didn't form until the fall semester started. Uh, so, so there are quite a number of things that are out there that are much, much older than our civilization and much, much older than our planet, even older than our galaxy. Uh, so I will post this video up, and I will post up the Carl Sagan Cosmos. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I will make another video for you now on the next chapter in your book, so stay tuned.